Fuck, I'm getting texts. I thought I was in airplane mode. Hold on. Okay. Okay, we're good. Sorry about that. Yeah, back home in Edmonton. Just figured I would take this opportunity to interview a friend that's very close to me that I don't get the opportunity to see much. Pretty excited. But before that, I'm going to give you an intro here and just update you as to what's new with me. Again, I feel there's a lot happening really quickly and everything seems to be really far on the spectrum of really good and really bad. Except now, for the first time in a while, it feels as if the good is outweighing the bad, which is... It's a relief, not gonna lie. Um, I'm working remotely out of my grandparents' house. Just figured it's best to spend as much time with them as I can, given I'm not back that often. And... I talked to them a lot over the phone and talked to my parents, but I hadn't been home in a while. And my mom had made it seem like my grandpa wasn't doing as good or that good at all. And seeing him in person, he's doing much better than I expected. So even though there's some bad news associated with that, it's actually a lot better than I thought. And it's nice to see him with a lot of energy, upbeat, happy same old guy that I've always known so that that's very heartwarming to just be able to spend this week here with him I got to see a very close friend of mine who was also a guest on the podcast albeit under very horrible circumstances um he lost his brother his brother's wife their two kids And there was also an orphan in the vehicle in a car accident in South Africa. They were doing missionary work. They were driving that orphan to the, to a track meet, I believe. Um, I might not have all the details perfect, but they were driving home and I think a tow truck had passed a solid, across a solid yellow line when he shouldn't have, obviously. And needless to say, I think you can, yeah, fuck. Just, it's unfathomable that this could happen to such like a loving family. They're doing missionary work, helping out at the orphanage. And like, just such a huge hit to the community here and to our friends. And I will say that The ceremony was phenomenal, and the support, I think there was 1,100 people or more that showed up, the entire church was packed, and there was nothing but love there. People came from all over the world, and I just hope that they felt all of the love that we were there to give, and I'm really glad that I got to come home and surprise them, and just be supportive, you know, like... I can't imagine what they're going through. I don't even know what it's like to have a brother, let alone to lose one, and the entire family associated with it. So that's that's heavy. Hug your family, hug your friends. It's, you never know. Um, yeah, fuck, that's so heavy. It's like every time I talk about it, I just seem to lose words and train of thought. I just get, like, overwhelmed with emotion, and it, yeah, I guess I could transition back to some of the the good things that are happening, because that's not what I want the entire episode, I don't want the entire episode to have that vibe, you know, I just want to let that guy know that I love him with all my heart, and I love his family, and they're nothing but amazing, so... Back home in Vancouver for me, I've got a couple of my Korean friends staying at my house while I'm gone, and I finally got a tattoo that I've been wanting for a very long time. It's of two foosball wraps. I'm a nerd, you all knew that before clicking this, and this is something that 
It's been on my mind for a while. And I didn't notice until after I got the tattoo that the photo that he took to trace over and draw up the tattoo, he actually pulled two different wraps off of my trophy shelf. And one is for my first ever open doubles win in Toronto. And one was for my first ever open singles win in Seattle. So the tattoo that I have is actually of my very first two wins that not local wins, I guess. First real wins to me, I suppose. So that was cool in hindsight that it was unexpected to get that. But the main part that I wanted to fill everyone in on is the battle with my work is, I guess it wasn't really a battle. It was more internally, but work has approved me working remotely and I honestly don't think that that's resonated yet what that means for the rest of my life or the next phase of my life but I figured that I should outline the way that I structured my email the way I negotiated this with them in case any listeners out there are going through comparable situation and maybe they want to make their work life a little better maybe it's a relationship whatever it is that you need to negotiate here's what I did hopefully it helps for me the allocated vacation time in my work didn't allow me to live the life that I desired and maybe there's a situation in your life holding you back Um, the first step that I took when expressing this to them was I needed to identify my real objective because in the past I took it almost situationally so if there was a tournament coming up or a skate trip coming up I would focus on that individual trip and it was almost as if those that know me if I get argumentative I can dig in to specifics and I just focus on those And it just seemed like I needed to take a step back instead of I need to go on this trip. I basically said I would love a a lifestyle where I can pursue what I really want. And that is I want to chase foosball tournaments around the world. I realized that I've been neglecting areas in my life that are important. And I've known that for years until my work approved me moving to Amsterdam, it really resonated at that point that I needed to make a change. I'm in the same situation that I was a year ago, but once they approved the possibility, my brain had expanded to this ideal world. And now that I'm back into the routine of the commute and basically where I was before, my expanded brain can't fit back in the box that it once resided, I guess. Um, Basically, I just want to pursue tournaments all over the world, and instead of having to rush home to save those vacation days, I'd like to stay for a week or two weeks or three months and skate and just get to know the culture and the city and still work full-time and still make the money that I'm making and be able to live the life that I live with a few extra additives on top. And I think it's important if you're in the steps of negotiating that you validate, I don't want to say the opposition because I think it's important that you work together, but for my example, for work, validate work. Like let them know that this isn't me wanting to quit. This isn't me wanting to be not a part of this team anymore. It's just that I've neglected these areas and personally I need I know that I need to focus on them. So the second step that I did was after identifying my true objective I had to brainstorm ways that these could become a reality. And for that it's very important to understand their objective. And for me I simply just wrote in my email that I think it's very important to me if the company could let me know their objective regarding my contribution to the team. Once I know that, I can figure out what I want, 
what they want, figure out overlapping ways that we can both get the desired outcome. I let them know that I truly appreciate all the training and the support they've gifted me over the years and I recognize it would sting to lose a teammate. So I offered a few solutions. I understood that if they just let me work remote and have the exact same role that I currently do, there's nothing stopping every other employee requesting the same thing and almost overnight the entire office could disintegrate into remote work. And I totally understand the fear of that. And I know that my project, my perspective is very biased. So I said, if you're not okay with that, like maybe we find some sort of contract work. I would lose my benefits. I would lose my job security. But I trust that they respect what I do at work enough that they would continue to give me work. I know my value in the company and I know that... I don't know how to word this. Yeah, I don't know. I guess I'm just rambling too much. Contract work was an option. I also said that I could find remote work somewhere else and then I could help stick around, train a replacement, and just let them know that I want a solution that benefits all parties involved. And once you've understand that objective, yeah, find that overlap. And this next part... I didn't actually put in the email. This is something that you're going to have to do prior to writing the email. And it might be the most important step of the whole process is fall in love with the idea of them saying no. I like being uncomfortable. Even if it sucks in the moment, I've been able to associate the feeling of the uncomfort with future growth and development. And I think the most important times of my life were times where I felt out of place or uncomfortable. And I like to test my resourcefulness. And I didn't need this deal with work to go through. If they said no, I know that I was going to make it. And I think it's very important to realize that that's where the power comes from in this negotiation. Is that I didn't need them to, to agree And I was completely transparent throughout the whole entire process that my heart is set on this and I just hope that we can find a solution that works for everyone. And after my very long-winded email, as you probably have guessed, I made a point to say I'd like to come home for these two weeks to Edmonton and do another trial run of remote work. I explained that I'd like to spend some more time with my grandparents and that I'd like to go to that memorial that I talked about earlier. But I wanted to make a note that for some reason as a culture, it's it's not difficult, at least in my experiences, to get approved time off work to go to the sad things. And I think that's really good. But I made a note at the bottom that I would like this remote relationship to benefit the good times and not just the sad. I know there's been times where I felt guilty requesting vacation time for positive things when they fall very short in line with negative things. It's almost as if they already gave me the favor of letting me go to the memorial. So other trips, they just, I don't know. It's, can you guys relate? I I assume that most of you know what I'm talking about. And I just really wanted to clear that up that No, like, I want this for everything. And once I sent that email, they read it, they thought about it for a couple days, they got back to me, and there was not even really much of a discussion. Um, They approved. So, again, it hasn't really sunk in. There's been a lot going on, so it hasn't really clicked yet, but... I can go anywhere in the world for as long as I'd like and work full time. And I guess it's kind of clicked because I've already booked a bunch of tickets. I'm going places. Uh, I'm in Edmonton right now. I come home and then I immediately fly to Hawaii with the same guys that I went with to Dubai a couple years ago. And then from there I come home 
I'm going to go back to the office and work there and just get settled in, into our new teams and figure out this new situation. But the next trip after that will be February. I'll be going to Portland for a tournament. And then my goal is to go to Florida and play with some of the best players in the world and get warmed up and ready for Vegas. And I'm going to go to the Vegas foosball tournament. And then after that, I'm going to head to Korea. And I don't know how long I'll stay there. I haven't really thought that far ahead, but I'm pretty damn excited because this is a life-changing turn of events for me. And on top of that, um, not sure yet if this is good news, bad news. I think it's a definitely a mixture of both. But uh, my foosball teammate and business partner, he has decided to move back home. And I don't really know what that means for the league and the tables and everything. I'm going to keep it for sure. I think he'd like to just kind of separate from it and just not have to think about it being so far away. But I'm hoping that back home is less of a struggle for him. I know he had a very hard time finding work that he was happy with here. And by here, I mean Vancouver. And it definitely hindered our playing together. Like I've said on previous podcasts, besides Washington, the last time we toured together was two and a half years ago. So maybe maybe him going home means he gets a job that he, he enjoys. Maybe he gets a place that's not as expensive as he currently lives in. And maybe we actually play more together, even though we don't live in the same city. Uh, it's going to suck to lose a friend that I see every day or every week or so, but I guess that's life, huh? Yeah. Welcome, Jamie Redmond. <laughs> Psych. I lied. That's pretty mean to do that. I wish we could have recorded a podcast, but we couldn't find the time. Actually, more realistically, we couldn't find a quiet space for a couple hours. <clears throat> Jamie's got a little boy running around his house, Royal. I wasn't at home, so I didn't have anywhere I could go. And it just fell through. I had recorded the intro earlier in the day when I had some time and we had plans to do the podcast. We just ended up going for a skate instead. It was fun, but it would have been nice to sit down, record something. So I apologize for those of you that were excited to hear Jamie. I didn't want to just throw away that intro. I was... An important moment for me, just getting that approval from work. And I figured that I could tack on a couple stories to the end of this podcast, make it real quick. But, fuck, I almost missed my flight home. And I've missed flights before, and I cut close more often than I'd like to admit. But this was hands down the closest I've ever pushed it for a flight. Straight mistake, because I'm an idiot, and I just didn't even check my itinerary until the day I was leaving. I do remember booking the flight three weeks before my flight home, and in my head, I was like, flying home at four, nice and easy. Told everyone, flying home at four, but I'm just sometimes kind of stupid, and... Apparently, I can't read a 24-hour clock, and it was 14 o'clock, not 4 o'clock, and my flight was at 2, and I was at my parents' house, I was working, I had clothes full cycle in the washing machine, I logged into my email to check in, and saw that my flight was at 2 p.m., not 4 p.m., and I realized at 1 p.m. 
My parents' house is 58 kilometers away from the airport. I hadn't packed a thing. I just let my dad know. Fuck! Flight's at two. He gets off the couch, runs to the garage, turns the vehicle on. I'm trying to pack everything into my bag without forgetting while trying to calm my mother down because she's freaking out. I throw all of my wet clothes in one Safeway bag, toss it on top of everything in my bag, throw the laptop together or into its case and compartments and everything, run out the door and we get in the truck and we're like, is it even, is it even worth going? Like, there's no way I'm making it. And we decided to go and just like, if not, I'll call Air Canada and just see what they can do for me, even though I know they're going to do nothing. And during the drive, dad's ripping. I check Google Maps and it says we're going to get there at 140. And I check the wait time CSA online for the security. Less than five minutes. So I get in. I run straight to the line because I know the auto check-in is just going to kick me off. There's a huge lineup, so I'm thinking it's going to take me 20 minutes just to get to the teller. Thankfully, everyone in line except for one person in front of me was one family, and we just bypassed all of them. The woman at Air Canada was very helpful. She called the pilot, explained that I had no check bags. And basically, they just gave me a standby ticket and said, if I can make it through security and get to the gate before they close it, which they're not going to wait for me, then they would give me a seat. And otherwise, I miss my flight. And there's zero line in security. I just walk straight in. They, I have an extra search, but that took maybe a minute. And thankfully, my gate was literally the closest gate to security and I made it there within seconds of them closing the gate but fuck I can't believe I made it but got home and yeah I've been back in Vancouver and I leave for Hawaii in the morning this time checked in know my flight time nailed it (laughs) Uh, well I guess knock on wood I haven't nailed it yet but I'll get there and Came home, went to the foosball league, and heard crazy story that happened there. Figured I'd fill you in on that too, because that's basically the only interesting things that happened this week. Um, One of the guys that's there all the time, he was parked right out front of the pub. And you can see, but you have to look. Like, it's not... Windows in the sense where you would just actually be able to have full visibility of your vehicle the entire time. You'd have to, like, go to the door, look through it. The reflections are kind of a pain in the ass. And I guess this dude walked in, and he was obviously intoxicated. I'm assuming multiple substances, just not fully there. And at first, they were just being very polite with him. And asking him to leave. And the dude started to say weird threats. But nonetheless threatening the lives of the people inside. Basically just saying like, I should stab you. I should stab you. But he reached behind the counter and grabbed the mixing spoon. And he was threatening to stab people with the spoon. And then a bigger, sober individual basically just walked over and was like, no, you're not. I'm going to take that and just basically forced it out of his hand and they escorted him out of the building. Later on in the night, a guy playing foosball, uh, a new player, I actually haven't met him. He was just a random guy that was interested that night. He went outside to smoke weed and saw a bunch of glass on the ground. I was like, oh shit, there's glass everywhere. Then he looked And he sees inside this van, which happens to be one of the guys from the foosball community, there's a dude inside of it. And I guess what happened was the guy unscrewed the no parking sign 
and started smashing the front window of the van with the no parking sign. It didn't break, so he moved to the back window. That one gave in. And he was inside rummaging around, but the person that caught him didn't realize that it was the same person as inside and actually thought it was the guy's van and thought that he had stumbled across his van broken into and he was making sure that everything was still inside. Turns out not the case. Once he realized that it was the drunk dude from inside, that guy just took off across the street, ran away. This guy didn't chase him, but he went back in and was like, yo, whose van is this? Ended up being one of our guys. He went out and apparently someone else had seen it and chased the dude across the street and they're both shirtless fighting. Oh, fuck, I missed part of the story. I guess he was looking for him, and there's usually homeless people right in front of that Honda dealership because there's vents that have a lot of hot air coming out, so it's warm in the wintertime, and while this man was looking for the guy that broke in, there was a homeless guy, but he was like fully covered with the boxes. He had his cardboard all around him, and all you could see was eyes, and he didn't clue in that that was the guy hiding in someone else's cardboard and then as he was walking away the home or the the drunk guy pretending to be homeless jumped out of the cardboard and ran towards him and they ended up getting in a big fight like i said both shirtless um one guy pinned to the ground but our foosball guy whose van was broken into he's not sure from a distance who's winning um Eventually, they realize that the drunk dude's on the ground, so the, everyone goes over there, they hold him down, they pat him for weapons, because he was threatening to stab people, but I guess it makes sense he didn't have one, seeing as he grabbed a spoon to try to hurt someone, which was fucking weird. Um, anyways, call the police, dude gets arrested, and this guy's van is fucked up. There's just so many dents from the sign, and yeah, just... Not what you expect to happen on a Monday night at foosball, but that was pretty weird. And that's pretty much all I got for you, I think. What else did I do? Mostly just crushing out a lot of work, trying to get ready for this trip. Had a nice Christmas dinner at my friend Martin's house. I had my Korean friends show up and shit, there was probably 15 people. Jordan was there friend Ryan gets in town tonight, and yeah, we're going to Hawaii. I got nothing else. Quick, in and out. Yeah, sorry for lying about Jamie Redmond being on the podcast. I would love it. Fuck. I'll get him on. There will be a time, there will be a place, and you will get to hear his beautiful voice. Thank you so much for listening. Goodbye.